Spider-Man 3 is a very unlucky product. Its movie was panned upon release and its game suffered an even worse fate. The movie and the game share a surprising amount of similarities, and not just in plot points. Ironically, that's where they differ the most. It's in their strengths, weaknesses, critical reception, and retrospective praise that the Spider-Man 3 game is almost identical to its counterpart. Both products are following a critically acclaimed movie and game, and both severely failed to meet expectations. We'll return to this parallel later, but for now, I want to frame the game and explain how the critical acclaim of Spider-Man 2 and Ultimate Spider-Man set expectations for Spidey games going forward. Spider-Man 2 delivered the, at the time, best swinging we ever had, all while looking great for the time, telling a solid story, and being hailed as the best for years to come. While Ultimate Spider-Man didn't revolutionize the character like Spider-Man 2 did, it was a great game, and one many, myself included, remember fondly. So when Spider-Man 3 released, fans were obviously disappointed, and no pun intended, it was the black sheep of the series, being the butt of jokes in many videos, including my own. But each time I made a joke regarding this game, there were people in the comments telling me that this game isn't that bad. So, here I am, ready to try the game for the first time in a while. And as is often the case with these games that are initially panned but retroactively deemed an underrated gem, the truth is that both sides have valid points. Yes, this game looks rough most of the time, yes, the story is very uninteresting, and yes, the gameplay is not as fluid as Spider-Man 2. But the game is also relatively competent in all those facets, and it has some decent boss fights. The biggest problem with Spider-Man 3 is that Spider-Man 2 does just about everything better. The same was true for Ultimate Spider-Man, but that got a pass because it wasn't a sequel and it had its own very respectable strengths. One of this game's strengths, just like the movie, is how unbelievably cheesy it is. And there's enough so bad it's good moments here that justify at least trying the game. With Marvel Spider-Man 2 just around the corner, I want to go back to yet another game where the symbiote is center stage, and see what went wrong and where Treyarch went right. So, with all of that said, let's take a look back at this, brace yourselves, 16-year-old game and figure out if Spider-Man 3 is truly an underrated gem or if its disregard is warranted. The first thing many will notice about Spider-Man 3 is that it looks worse than a PS2 game. Don't believe me? Look at Spider-Man 2. And here's the kicker, this is a PS3 game. Yeah, a pretty poor start to say the least, and it doesn't improve for the PS2 version of the game. We'll be focusing on the PS3, Xbox 360, and PC version of the game because it's the one most are familiar with, and it's the game with the most content, but I seriously wouldn't blame someone for opting for the last generation version version instead. The PS2 version, while having less content, trims the fat from the PS3 version, and while it may not look as nice, it is still a fine enough game, even including its own black suit mechanic that we'll talk about later. But let's stay focused on the PS3 version, because oh man does it start poorly. The tutorial itself is familiar, as Bruce Campbell is back yet again to both teach you the controls and mock your ineptitude. We're thrusted right into the action, defeating bombers, and once we get to the hostage, we see the first major flaw and strength with the game, the quick time events. Why is this a flaw? Well, many would consider quick time events to be a lazy supplement for gameplay, and and while I understand that argument, I wouldn't agree. Older games didn't always have the power or developer muscle to work on every crazy set piece idea, so an on the rail scene that fulfills a Spider Man fantasy while allowing some input from the player is the next best thing. The strength here is that every failed quick time event has a unique animation, meaning I died so many times trying to see them all, and the weakness is not the quick time event, but the goal. This lady. Ugh. I don't usually cover horror games on the channel, but fuck me if this isn't a glaring exception. Look, I know Spider-Man 2 had some ugly character models, but at least it had a consistent style that allowed the JPEG faces to fit into the world, making them easier on the eyes. But here, the characters' faces feel uncanny, and you know what it is? It's the eyes. Look at the lady in the beginning. The problem is not her mouth, nose, hair, it's those massive eyes. Okay, she's a tad pale too, but you get the point. And it's the same reason J. Jonah Jameson looks like he just huffed a hookah hooked up to someone's asshole. The other major issue is that the eyebrows are near non-existent for most of these characters. Some like Peter and MJ are fine and the model for Spider-Man looks okay, but many of these cutscenes look like they belong in a source film animation. Speaking of which, outside of cutscenes, the game looks pretty good animation-wise, and the swinging looks solid as does combat, as it offers smooth animations and cinematic angles as a reward for pulling harder combos off. It enters unrealistic territory, but never in a way that is too ridiculous. The greatest compliment I can pay the animation work is again in those quick time events where in either failure or success, it's slick, and the designs of the characters like Venom, Sandman, and the Lizard are solid, but holy hell is Venom thick in this game, my god! All the villains look the way they should, and then Thunder Thighs comes in with the goofiest design I've seen of the character. I'm sorry, I'm getting distracted. The quick time events are abundant, but they're never too challenging, and I'm only talking about them more so I have more time to show you all the hilarious ones I encountered. It's almost a shame, because the best QTE is in the beginning of the game. To go back to the burning building, outside of the faces, everything here looks good. It's just a shame that once you exit the city, you see the city. 
New York doesn't look bad per se. It just looks worse than it did in 2. And that's a major issue. I find it strange that the city seems so much smoother and brighter than Spider-Man 2, not only because it makes it look worse, but because I imagine the black suit would mesh better with a darker, more jagged world. There's plenty of grit to be found here, but when some of the characters look like they're made of clay, it makes me wonder why everything seems less detailed. It could be that the team wanted more stable frame rates, because you can truly virtually fly across the city. It could be that the city is twice the size of New York in Spider-Man 2, and it could have also been that the team was inexperienced. An important caveat to give for this game is that yes, it looks bad, and there's jank in every corner, but this is one of the first games for the PS3, releasing in 2007, the same year as the PS3's Western release. It's common knowledge that the PS3 was tricky to develop for, and a mixture of this being new hardware and a billion different versions of this game being worked on at once could be why the game looks simpler and less polished. Games Apologist has a great video covering all the versions of this game if you're interested. There's also an argument to be made that fatigue or rushing played a role in how this game turned out. When disarming a bomb, you'll see plenty of pipes across the screen, and sometimes they are properly connected, and other times they are not. Some combat animations look cinematic and fluid, while others look far less so. I don't want to give an autopsy on a game this old, especially when I, as I've admitted many times, am not a game designer, but I'm simply trying to rationalize the state of this game because I just don't believe it was the result of a lack of care. The soundtrack is proof of this, because there are some great tracks here, and despite how much I've ragged on Tobey Maguire's voice acting skills in prior entries, he actually does a fine enough job this time around. It's not great, but he sounds like he wants to be here, as opposed to his half-asleep delivery in previous installments. Every other voice actor delivers here too, with J.K. Simmons never missing, and the only standout disappointment is Curse and Dunst. The game sounds good, despite any visual bugs, of which there are plenty. Plenty of the behind-the-scenes videos showcase a lot of ambition. In fairness, nobody would include clips of developers saying they don't care, but what I mean is that during many aspects of the game, you can tell that whoever worked on it had passion for the project. Scenes like the battle against Sandman are a ton of fun, and the same goes for the new Goblin boss fight. It's simply some instances where the game lacked polish. The game is consistently rough around the edges, and when it works, I didn't want to put it down. But when it doesn't, I can see why the game got the scores it did. And trust me, if there's one thing that never worked in this game, then it's that godforsaken camera. The camera the camera in this game is easily the worst I've played. It gets caught on objects often, it consistently fights you, and all of this is tenfold in smaller environments, and you'll never guess where most of the missions here take place. That's right, in small, tight spaces. The fact that this game had the gall to suggest you use stealth when this is how the camera acts is fucking insane to me. It caused death countless times, and it makes it difficult to know where your objective is. To aid the difficulty in finding your goal, the game offers Spidey Sense, an Eagle Vision-esque lens that actually predates the first Assassin's Creed. It works the same as that game, highlighting important objects or enemies, and I I appreciate that the game didn't force you to rely on it, as future games to adopt the mechanic would. But the problem it solves, the game not being clear on what to do or how to do it, is something that plagued Web of Shadows as well. The idea that a system has depth, but the game does not go very far to teach you how to reach it. This leads to frustration and confusion, and this is especially noticeable in combat. Combat is a standard fare with light attacks, heavy attacks, and a dodge button. The dodge button is a nice idea. You have a meter where time slows down, allowing for Peter to automatically dodge an incoming attack, and for the player to quickly reposition. The problem is that when a can dodge animation plays, a large chunk of the meter is drained meaning that there are many combos enemies can perform that outlast your dodge meter. One of the earliest examples is the enemies with guns. Even in a one-on-one -on -one battle, if an enemy unloads a submachine gun mag in your direction, you will only dodge half of them. We see this again when facing Venom, whose basic combo achieves the same thing. The difference is that his attacks do devastating damage, and you simply cannot dodge it. So it seems your ability to dodge is defined, but for the enemies, it is the exact opposite. Spider-Man 3 has a great tutorial. They teach you the basics of attacking, dodging, and moving. And once out in the city, there's a thorough swinging tutorial, which is great, but that is where it ends. When in combat, you'll throw out a punch, and sometimes it'll connect, and other times it won't. And there's little indication as to why. What I figured out as experimenting is that some enemies are vulnerable to any attacks, some only to heavy attacks, some to grab, some to specials, and some to rage attacks. But there is no rhyme or reason for it. This made the first playthrough extremely frustrating, because it took nearly until the end of the game to realize who was vulnerable to what, and even into my second playthrough, I was struggling. Sometimes enemies can be web-pulled, other times they cannot. Where this is at its most obvious is in the boss fight. When fighting against Kraven the Hunter, in his first phase, he'll block random attacks, but if you just keep pummeling him, then eventually enough will connect for him to go down. But in his second phase, he is consistently invulnerable, and it leads to a tedious fight because the solution is to farm the infinitely spawning lackeys to build up the rage meter, and then use your rage attacks to win, and that isn't very fun, especially when even some of the rage attacks are blocked. You can do this kind of fight well, such as in Kingpin's case, where he blocks all non-rage attacks and you have to consistently swap from defense to offense as you build up the rage meter. In fact, the biggest issue with this fight is just how long it is. An enemy's attacks can be unblockable or them invulnerable if it follows a particular pattern. For example, the lizard will always perform a few different combos, some ending in an unblockable attack and others ending in one that can be exploited. In each, there is an indicator that tells you what to prepare for, and it shows up fast enough so that you can react, but you still need to be quick if you want to avoid it. Venom follows a similar pattern, where he will attack like normal, delivering dodgeable and exploitable combos, but when he enters a rage
rage state you need to run. To turn the tides back in your favor, you can smack a stack of pipes to stun him. The new problem that shows up is that this is all the fight is, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Throughout the entire game, knowing clearly what an enemy can and cannot be hit by and when will be a consistent challenge. Fortunately, outside of this challenge, the moment to moment combat is fun. There are a ton of different combos to perform, with a new one being unlocked after every mission, and trying different tactics to solve different problems was rewarding as hell. In one mission, I had to defend a dispenser for two whole minutes while lizards attacked it. After failing the obvious approach, beating them up, I instead used a super move to web all of them at once and swung them around indefinitely. This allowed me to keep almost all of them in one spot and then hit any stragglers that got close with a reptilian wrecking ball. Spinning the stick so much that my thumb got sore did indicate that this may not have been the intended solution, but I still enjoyed doing it my way. I appreciated the enemy variants introduced when the game opens. Since the events of Spider-Man 2, a few new gangs have appeared across New York. The Apocalypse are your Mad Max style anarchists that have slow moving and forgiving attacks, perfect for the early game. Then there's the Arsenic Candy, a group of goth mommies that while moving faster and having more tools, won't shred your health bar like our final group. The Dragon Tail. The Dragon Tail are trained fighters that all have the tools to catch Peter off guard, both on the ground and in the air. I appreciate the difficulty of these enemies because the air is uncontested for the first three hours. A lazy player may rely on the air for easy wins, but the Dragon Tail will specifically punish that. The only problem I see with this is that the anti-air enemies come too late into the game, resulting in a difficulty spike that is sure to annoy. Most of the challenges in combat come from numbers, and there's an admitted tedium in fighting groups simply because there is so much to keep track of, which results in my favorite parts being the boss fights. Some are good, some are bad and others are hilariously short. I already mentioned the lizard having a great fight, and the same goes for his rematch, which sees you throwing the kaiju into some generators. The Sandman fight is likely my favorite because it perfectly parallels the movie set piece, and it's a focused one-on-one -on -one fight that delivers everything I would have asked for. Now that only applies to the first Sandman fight, and it certainly does not apply to the second round, where you don't even fight him as Peter. Midway through an intense fight against Venom, we cut to Harry watching the fight on the news and feeling compelled to aid Peter. We are thrusted into a tutorial for the Goblin, and I was both impressed and disappointed. Impressed because there's a whole kit here, you have movement options, bombs, and swords to use, but the fight doesn't incorporate the added mobility of the glider and we lose our sword almost instantly. The fight, I kid you not, is just flying above Sandman and throwing down bombs. It's a cool set piece visually, sure, but this is the epitome of just mashing a button to win. So there's fights where you do nothing but tap the same button, there's fights where you can only attack during undefined and inconsistent intervals, and now we can talk about the most fun fights, which are those in which you bully. Two fights in particular were very funny. The leader of both the Dragon Tail and the Arsenic Candy. They were admittedly easy and as far as mechanical challenge they proved very little, but holy hell was it satisfying to just wipe the floor with these people. I mean, for the head of the dragon tail, I was just slamming him back and forth like the Hulk. It was awesome. Okay, okay. I haven't talked about the swinging yet, and many have ragged on it for not being as good as Spider-Man 2, and I agree, it's weaker, but it's still good. Before we dive into what works and doesn't, I need to lay down some foundation. I've made the rookie mistake of reading YouTube and TikTok comments, and within them I have found a vague definition of what physics-based swinging is, and I get it. What the hell does physics-based even mean? Well, well, some people say that Spider-Man PS4 is physics-based, but Web of Shadows isn't, or that Web of Shadows is, but PS4 isn't, and it all leads me to believe that nobody understands what physics-based is, and that's not because you're all stupid, except you, Steven, get it together, man. It's because the term is not often clearly defined. I won't do that here, but I will point you to Jamie Fristrom, who during a GDC panel explained the difference between Spider-Man 1 and 2 beautifully. To adapt his words, physics drove the animations where previously animations drove the physics. This is what I imagine when I think physics-based swinging. I also want to define what realism in a Spider-Man context means to me. Something Fristrom also points out is that when creating something realistic, there are certain things people just don't care about, such as gravity being much stronger than Earth, Spider-Man jumping a ridiculous height, and steering in mid-air to name a few. Realism is the threshold in which I am unable to be immersed in the fantasy. For Fristrom, he believes that webs must attach to buildings, but that hasn't bothered me in games like Web of Shadows or The Amazing Spider-Man. My desire for a swinging system is one that balances fulfilling a fantasy with depth. My two favorite swinging systems are Web of Shadows and Spider-Man Miles Morales, and yet these two couldn't look more different. The reason Miles Morales is so good is because it fulfills a fantasy. It looks amazing, it's fluid, it's expressive, but there are strict confines. Wanna do a 360 swing? No can do. Wanna swing off a lamppost? Well you can, but only off the top, and only in one canned animation and direction. In Web of Shadows, it may not look as pretty, but you can go faster and do more, which goes a long way for expression. This whole side tangent is to say that Spider-Man 3 has good swinging, but it sacrifices some of the control for fluidity. Animations have proper beginnings and ends, and Peter expresses himself more during his swings and zips. In fact, you'll notice that many of these animations were later used in Web of Shadows. Again, they're sacrifice, I'll never be able to throw out a new line while holding my current line, but the fundamentals are here, and using the swing boost and the web zip boost with all the other abilities allowed for solid traversal that was enjoyable throughout my playthrough. You can run along walls and jump off of them with great speed, you can swing from poles, and as physics would have it, your momentum carries over well around corners. Where the swinging becomes unique in this game is with scale. I know I've criticized the look of the game a lot, but credit where it's due, 
the scale is insane. You truly feel the height of the buildings here, and it makes traversing these obstacles more challenging, as you more consistently lack the option to clear a building in your way, and instead have to actively avoid it. It's one of the many reasons I find myself returning to this game, outside of the black suit. Granted, swinging in the black suit doesn't change much, aside from the movement animations, which are appreciated, but that is unfortunately the same for combat. The black suit is a great canvas for the developers to show us how Peter's aggression is amplified, and the only way this is shown is with the rage function. It can be achieved very slowly by tapping the bumper, but it's best charged by dodging and attacking, which rewards aggression. And when aggression is rewarded more in the black suit, then the player, like Peter, is more likely to be unrelenting. I like that. Unfortunately, many of the missions and boss fights rely on the rage, forcing you to farm it. The rage mechanic also highlights how much better combat would be if enemies couldn't block as well. Using rage makes the pace of the combat controlled by you, and it becomes less about winning and more about winning with style. Red suit will see you fighting to win, and to subdue enemies, but the black suit is all about styling on them. Most missions are tailored for this extra power, so there is still a challenge, and you might through extreme skill be able to get by without the rage, but you'll need to hone your skills, which can be done through the races, combat tours, and a few others. The races scale in difficulty well, allowing it to act as a further test for new players learning to jump with precision and swing with speed, and your reward is more speed, which at its peak goes fast enough to make traversal surprisingly challenging. The later chases will take some more effort, but I had hoped for the variety and difficulty that Ultimate Spider-Man provided. Some of those endgame races required perfection from you. Thankfully, combat tours make a return, and they're good. I wish I had more to say about them, but they were just an excuse to farm enemies in Ultimate, and the same is true here. I was initially disappointed at how few there are, but this is because there are some combat-centric challenges in the menu that drop you into various arenas. These were fun and at times really tough, though I wonder why the game calls almost no attention to these. I almost miss them entirely. The penultimate challenge we'll talk about is the bomb tours, which are just bomb minigames back to back. I enjoy diffusing the bombs for what it's worth, though I think knocking the bombs into the ocean is a lot more fun. Finally, we have the skydives, and uh, quick question, what the fuck is this? Like. What are, what are we doing? I don't mean to be rude, but genuinely, who asked for this? I'd excuse it if it was fun, but I have bad news for you. This controls like hell. And even when I figured out the controls, I was just not into it. You just skydive through the rings, allowing for only one swing to finish the run on different platforms that provide more points depending on distance and size. I can appreciate goofy side activities in games, and I'll admit, the novelty is cool, but anything about this idea past paper is just not great. So, side content here is definitely a mixed bag, but the main campaign is fortunately more consistent and pretty fun. While it becomes a pacing issue in terms of plot, bouncing around these relatively relatively self-contained stories ensures that you are always doing something interesting, fighting a new type of enemy, engaging with a new gimmick, and while some missions fare better than others in terms of execution, I prefer some variety over the same gameplay loop over and over. In one arc, we'll help Matt Gargan, who was just turned into the Scorpion, and we save him by sneaking through a facility, playing as the Scorpion, and eventually we fight him, and then Rhino with him. Some of the not-so-great missions were those taking place in the sewer, as the environments were just boring. Granted, the gameplay was solid, and there's an interesting mechanic where the lizards will sometimes try to jump you when walking around a corner, and the takedowns are just brutal. Others like the finale to the Apocalypse storyline see you fighting their leader, and this is one of the worst fights in the game. He has consistent armor, attacks that come out at inhuman speeds, and the most effective way of taking him down is to wait for him to attack you and counter. Because this is an early game boss, it makes sense that the game might be testing the player, forcing them to counter over and over. But not only did we already have a tutorial and multiple combat segments to get here, we do it here ad nauseum, and the lizard fight achieves the goal in more effective ways. When in between objectives, you can come across crime in the open world. At times, it's a bank robbery, sometimes a car chase, sometimes someone will hilariously get blown up. They are just excuses for combat and they don't need to be much more. The issue I took is with the way some of these pop up. Because if you're on the way to a mission marker, this will take priority until you are far away from it. Meaning you have to either pull over or swing blind for a bit. Now maybe that's because the game wants you to be like Spider-Man and make these pit stops, in which case, fair enough. But you could encourage it more by giving experience or something like that. Unfortunately, they don't contain the same awkward conversations that Spider-Man 2 gave us. While the game is full of cheese and rough edges, it's also full of hilarious glitches. Some see you stuck on geometry, others see a falling civilian slowly drifting from your grip, and others are just downright annoying. Like how any mission in the subway or sewers blew my headphones out. One of the funniest bugs was when I was finishing the game. I was spawned in briefly before the credits, and you know what? I'll just show you. Friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. I genuinely could not think of a more appropriate end to the game. A perfect blend of jank and hilarity that encapsulates what this is. Gameplay on the whole won't blow you away. In fact, it'll frustrate you plenty. But those brief moments where it works perfectly are damn fun. And it made me happy to return to it. The combat just feels good. Punches connect well, and despite some annoying design decisions, there's plenty of high points that justify sledging through the lows. But of course, the real reason you'll want to keep going is to experience firsthand all of the meme-worthy moments in the story. Spider-Man 3 follows the story of the movie so loosely that I am not sure if it's 
worth analyzing. There's a series of quest lines involving the different gangs and villains around New York that see you going to a location, beating someone up, and then having a boss fight, ending with you locking up the bad guys. After you complete a few of these, you'll unlock a story mission, often a boss fight with little context, assuming you haven't seen the movie, and you repeat the process until seemingly out of nowhere you get the finale. It leads to a story that is heavily disjointed and unremarkable. If it weren't for some of these horrific animations or hilarious lines, I would have forgotten every beat of the story, and hell, I did. I played this game a month ago for fun, and then a week ago for this video, and in that month, I forgot that Craven was in the game, because he just shows up and is gone as fast as he came, wink. But seriously, there is no through line here, and while that does work in some cases, it serves the game in 30 minute chunks, it also means that there is no story. But we do have at least some characterization to discuss. The most notable is that Peter is snarky as hell and delivers actual laugh out loud lines. I am so sick of you mouth breathing knuckle draggers. There's also Venom, who is just amazing on screen, not in an imposing way, but through the hilarity of his confidence in animations, I can't get enough of it. Mary Jane and Harry both act like they do in the movie, but this dinner scene between Peter and MJ is just gold. Individual arcs have their nice moments, the dialogue between DeWolf and Spider-Man is well done, and some of the villains have interesting backstories too, like the Mad Bomber who bombs the Daily Bugle because they published a paper that exposed a scam the Mad Bomber revealed to be Lucas Carlyle was running, or Dr. Connors who suffers from visions and trauma from his last time as a lizard and does what he can to make a cure. Look. I can riff about individual moments all day, but I think it's best if we just leave it at that. This is one of the few times where there's just nothing to sink my teeth into, and what there is, is contained to individual arcs that are so short they can't go far, and so disconnected from each other that they ultimately don't matter. My one gripe about the story, and this is more of a gameplay gripe, is that we get the black suit over two thirds into the game, and we lose it really quick. I understand that to follow the plot of the movie, you can't have it the whole game, but why not make some of these side quests playable in the black suit? Otherwise, it just seems arbitrarily locked off. Overall, I'm very conflicted with this game because despite it being bad in so many ways, God, I enjoyed playing it. It's so fascinating because Spider-Man 2 is memorable and exceptional because it is a fun game that is well-made and well-polished, yet Spider-Man 3 is also memorable in spite of how much of a mess it is. Its jank is the cause for humor, its story is a constant stream of unintentionally funny moments, and its swinging is actually good. Is the same true for the PS2 version? Less so. But admittedly, the black suit is significantly better in that game, as you can activate it whenever, and you must complete a quick time event to take it off. But that quick time event becomes harder as the suit bonds to you more. The game also has exclusive content like a side quest surrounding Morbius. It's a port of the PSP version, which hinders it tremendously, but despite this, it's still fun to play, and I would consider it a solid game if Spider-Man 2 didn't exist and clear it in every facet. And that's the sad truth about Spider-Man 3. If Spider-Man 2 didn't exist, I'd be comfortable calling the game fine, maybe even good. But we've seen what the team can do, we know where the bar is set, and this just doesn't meet the new standards. With the following releases, Ultimate Spider-Man, Spider-Man 3, Friend or Foe, all having mechanics severely limited compared to Spider-Man 2, it makes me wonder if its success was a fluke. Maybe the team didn't know how to catch that lightning in a bottle again. Or maybe after Spider-Man 2, they were burnt out. Who knows? Regardless, Spider-Man 3 remains one of the most fun bad games I've played, and while its quality arrests my desire to call it good, I recommend it if you can find a way to get your hands on it. Hello everyone, thank you for watching this video, I appreciate it. Please excuse my voice, I'm currently sick right now and that's why I'm going to keep this outro brief. Uh, thank you to our patrons and YouTube members for supporting the channel. If you want to support the channel and get access to these videos early, you can of course do so by clicking the link in the description, I would appreciate it greatly. Uh, you can also find my Discord and my Twitter in the description, uh, I'd appreciate a follow and you can join the Discord if you want to uh, chat about games. And yeah, that's basically all I got. Spider-Man 3, a not so good game that I really like. That's it. Okay, take care. Bye.